think this is good news for analytical chemistry. And maybe, uh, maybe we have to plan for another lecture and then that time we'll go to Big Bang to see if there is C3, right? But because it's between semesters and uh, there was this uh, short vacation for Carnival, we thought we wouldn't have many customers. But anyway, it's a pleasure to see all of you here. And um, it's also a big pleasure, and that's the biggest pleasure, to have Professor Gary Christian here with us today. Well, you, uh, his name is familiar to you. Uh, he's a professor of analytical chemistry in the final years of his uh, activist career. Uh, he was a professor uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, and uh, so you will, uh, you may know many of his publications, but uh, apart from uh, anything else, he has recently uh, issued the seventh edition of his book on analytical chemistry. So he has many, uh, several other books before on spectrophotometry, on chromatography, He's been uh, involved, or he's been a key person in uh, some technical and scientific developments uh, like uh, flow injection analysis. And uh, so um, you have uh, the opportunity of going back after his lecture and having a deeper look in uh, uh, his curriculum and uh, so, I just, uh, I don't want to spend much time, um, but uh, just a few references. Uh, Professor Gary Pearson has had several awards. Uh, he's, uh, he's an honorary <laughs> member of the Japan Society of Electrical Chemistry. He has an, off, an honorary PhD degree from the University of uh, Thailand. Uh, the Jaffia Scientific Honor Award Medal, the American Chemical Society Fisher Award in Analytical Chemistry, and the uh, Analytical Chemistry, uh, American Chemical Society Division of Analytical Chemistry Award for Excellence in Teaching, uh, Medal of Honor from the University Libre de Bruxelles, Talenta Gold Medal, Charles University Commemorative Medal, Jeff Wilson Medal from Deakin University, and so on and so forth. This is just the uh, just a few. So, um, apart from being a professor of analytical chemistry, actually I should say, once I was involved in a questionnaire and we found out, um, when I was representing the Portuguese Chemical Society in the European Federation of Chemical Societies, we uh, carried on this questionnaire, and we found out that uh, Professor Gary Christian, his book was the m most cited and most used by European universities. It was the most common to actually professor didn't know that when I told that he was quite surprised. So he's the most common reference book to uh, European uh, universities in analytical chemistry. Um, and uh, apart from that also, for 20 years he's been the editor-in-chief of Talenta, the journal in which uh, some of us are publishing. The topics that uh, could be presented today could be various ones. We could choose among uh, several. Um, we hope to have Professor that This is serious. It's not joking because uh, we have a house full and we want another opportunity. This is serious. There are plans for Professor Gary Christian to come again to Portugal, not only to work uh, with us, but with other colleagues uh, from other universities as well and to other meetings. So it was a happy coincidence that uh, uh, I came across the opportunity of developing some work with uh, Professor Gary Christian. Recently I visited him in Seattle and now I'm pleased to uh, be able to have this opportunity of uh, having invited Professor for a, a small presentation. We called it a group seminar because as I said we were not expecting um, that many people would be around the building today. So we'll leave the door open so that it doesn't get like a sauna. This is the seventh edition, and it's uh, it's 
assigned to me. And when I arrived here back from Seattle at home, I realized I knew I had the previous edition. I thought maybe the third or fourth, and maybe I have the third or fourth. But when I got here, I realized I had the sixth, also signed by professors. <laughs> so we were going back and thinking, when have we met that you, I signed this copy for you? Must have been in Euroanalysis in Salamanca. We were going through the dates. So I have two copies signed by Professor Gary Christian, which I think is not very common at that. I'm pleased with him. So please, Professor Gary Christian, uh, we are happy to have this opportunity. We thank you for having come and for the trouble. And we'll enjoy your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Phil, for that nice kind of introduction. It's certainly my great pleasure to be here. I've never had a standing room only, or you have to bring your own chair. It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as, as Phil Mina mentioned, I've been editor in chief of Philanthropy for over 20 years, almost over 25 years. So, I thought I'd talk a little bit about my experience in that. So, the title of my talk is The Ethics of Scientific Writing. How to write a paper, how not to write a paper. I'm going to give you some interesting examples of what people do. <coughs> okay. okay, so publications, of course, is how, how we communicate the work that we've done and we spread our knowledge to a oral and written uh, conference and so forth. This is how scientists are evaluated on their work, this is how promotions of scientists are, are dependent on, on scientific achievement and so, so forth. So we talk about publish or perish. <coughs> and ethics of scientific writing is, is important and, and uh, so I'll talk about some of the good and the bad. And it's become a, a more of a problem for editors these days in, the, in the, these days of, of electronic age where people can cut and paste them so easily, purposely or, or, or accidentally. So I'll give you some examples. So we worry about plagiarism. What is the what's use of other people's work without acknowledging it and calling it sort of a wrong? <coughs> Something that's more common is self-plagiarism, where you may <coughs> copy works from your prior publications and not cite that prior publication, <coughs> make a new publication out of it. And, and that's fairly common. So this is a journal I've been editing for, for many years, and we uh, uh, we have several uh, associate editors and editor, uh, co-editors. I have a co-editor-in-chief, Jean-Michel Kaufman, uh, and he handles manuscripts from uh, Europe. And, I, and then we have editor, or associate editors that handle um, from uh, South America and Africa, Middle East, so they live here from Venezuela. Jin Hua Wang handles those from China. <coughs> He gets over a thousand, he literally gets a thousand a year. Um, and um, I got help from Ian McKelvey a couple of years ago. I was getting close to 500 papers a year, so I got him to help. I got to get down to 200. I'm still back up to 400. But, uh, and and so, so we handle the rest of the world. Our, uh, our 800 pound grill is India and Asia and so forth. And so we handle papers geographically. Uh, <coughs> So I'll, I'll talk a little about how you should start, you, you know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story, how you start your paper, tell a story, because that's what you're going to do. You're going to tell a story. And I'll tell you some do's and don'ts and how to take advantage of peer review. Peer review is actually for your advantage as well as for the editor. And it gives you a better product. And so I'll talk some about safe plagiarism, about duplication, about plagiarism itself, uh, uh, Fabrication, and I'll talk about the biggest fraud case in chemistry that made a lot of press that I was heavily involved with, and some about reviewer responsibility, what we expect from the reviewers. So the first thing you should do is read the aims and scope of the journal. Is this the right journal to publish in? And so you read our aims and scope, and we say we're not looking for uh, routine stuff that's been published before, uh, and uh, you shouldn't have a whole series of similar articles, you should have a more complete article if you can, and so forth. It's a challenge that editors work with. So read the exit mm -hmm. scope of the journal. We often get papers that have nothing to do with analytical chemistry. So we're not looking for cookbook chemistry. There's absolutely nothing wrong with cookbook chemistry. In fact, that's why we do our research. We want to develop methods that people can use. And so that's really the purpose of a lot of our work. But that's not what we're looking for in a, in a first class journal, cookbook chemistry that's well known as what you can publish. 
So the first thing that's in the paper is the abstract. That might be the last thing you write, but uh, that should be brief to the point to give the principle of the method you're going to talk about. Uh, and it should include a summary of your important results, your figures of merit, uh, range of measurement, detection limits, precisions, what samples you've analyzed. This is not an introduction to your work. This is not where you justify the work you're doing. This is just a summary of your results. <laughs> So the introduction is, is uh, where you start telling your story. And I tell students that the first sentence in a paper is the hardest one to write. Why? Because you have to get clear in your mind how you're going to structure the paper. So once you write, have that in your mind, you write that first sentence and you're on your way. Uh, so you are going to tell a story. Say why this work is important. What problem are you addressing? Uh, <clears throat> what's been done in the past? Don't ignore the literature. Give the relative references, and sometimes people don't. Um, how are you advancing the state of the art? And don't say that prior work is no good, because those authors may become the reviewers. <laughs> and they, they do sometimes. And so I like the last sentence in the introduction to sort of say in one, one sentence what you're doing, what, uh, what, what is your study, to put it in context for the reader, the reviewer. Experimental, of course, is where you put information that somebody can repeat your work. So you want to provide your, your chemical sources of chemicals, implementation, uh, and so forth, the procedures that you're using. If you're relying on prior uh, literature uh, for some of your uh, procedures, <laughs> cite, cite those uh, references. Results and discussion. This is sort of the meat of your story now. This is where we're going to tell you what, what we've done. Uh, and again, it should be succinct and clear give the basis of your method. I'll often get a paper that has a new reagent for something that works beautifully, but they don't say why they sought to do it. Why did you think it was going to work? You know, give some background of why you're doing this study. Uh, and you should, of course, organize by topics. I like some headings that makes it easier, clearer to, to uh, see what you've done. Uh, use tables and figures, of course, to help summarize some of your, your results. Uh, the figures, of course, are very good to have. You don't want to have too many of them. Some people will, will just reproduce their whole notebook of figures. We have to uh, get that cut down a little bit. Uh, don't use straight lines. We, we prefer uh, just using these square lines and our square values and so forth. And don't use too many figures. And sometimes you can find, can combine the information in two figures into one and then two different axes and so forth for to make your comparison easier. Again, tables. Don't put in uh, too, too, too much data. We just want to have enough that we can say, I, I, you, somebody can reproduce your, reproduce your results and get the same results you have. And uh, pay attention to significant figures. Uh, sometimes we'll get, with computers these days, a calculation will spit out 10 figures. And some people will report 10 figures. That tells me they don't really have a good grasp or <coughs> feeling of how accurate or precise their method really is. And we want some statistics, standard deviations, key tests, and so forth. Conclusions is, should not be a repeat of the abstract. Some people do that. Uh, and uh, often they're not needed, but if you have a fairly detailed paper and lots of different results, it's good to summarize what the key findings were in a conclusion uh, section. Uh, we, of course, rely on reviewers to provide uh, advice, expert advice on papers. And, and, but it's up to me if the editor will make the decision after I get the reviews in. Most of you will review. How many of you have reviewed papers here before? Okay, a few of you have. Okay. Um, uh, you, of course, are, are going to be ethical and so forth, but not everybody yet. You'll find out when you read some papers. And uh, it's easy, as I say, to slip up yourself and, and, and self plagiarize if you're not careful. Um, and especially in this digital age, it's so easy for, for an unethical or lazy author to cut and paste and copy others' works without citing it, or if their own work. Um, we do ask uh, uh, reviewers to check prior works of the author, and there are different ways you can do that. And we, we do, in our instructions to the reviewers, we do ask them to, to, to do that, and we give some sources like Sci-Finder, Scholar, Science, Drag, Scopus, and so forth, where you can 
check uh, uh, for example work and other people's work. Some people do that, some don't. Um, and a shower review is not very good to do that for uh, some time I'll get a, a review. This is good work published, no, no comment. Uh, or this is bad work, don't publish, no comment. That doesn't help very much. Um, and I'll give examples where reviewers have been key in keeping out bad papers, but also give some examples of what they did. So some examples. Give the rationale for your work, don't ignore that of others, <coughs> and don't ignore your own. Uh, here's an editorial that was written several years ago in Chemical Engineering News by the editor of the Organic <coughs> Process Journal. And he said he pointed out that authors deliberately don't cite a competitor's work. Why they don't want the reviewers to know that there's a competition, uh, and they may also neglect to mention their own work. And, and the reason for that is that the work is some of the previous publications they've had, so they don't cite their own work. Uh, today it's a little easier to find these things out with, with digital searches and so forth. This is what we call subplagiarism. So some examples. Some reviews. Uh, this, this reviewer says it's not a clear classification. The authors have disregarded extensive research spent on, on this topic for the last decade. It's not novel. Reject. Don't repeat your own work. This reviewer says the authors published a quite similar paper in, and I give the reference here, I didn't put the journal, so the uh, significance of the measurements is weak. So we didn't accept that paper. These are just a few simple examples. Uh, this work is similar to several other papers from this group, reject. So these are real reviews, and some of them are pretty old. Here's a, a paper I got a few years ago I guess 1995 actually, no, no, 2007 I guess it was, uh, paper number 95. Uh, a, a new reagent for tungsten 6, and the author claimed it was the best reagent there was for tungsten 6. Best sensitivity, best selectivity. And he's using a uh, benzyl one benzopyrene complex. Well, I happened to do a search on this author, and I found two papers that he just published recently uh, using benzopyrene complexes, but with a little different functional group on them. That's the only difference. And if you compare the three papers, all the figures were identical. The selectivities were identical. The sensitivities were identical. So how can this be the best there is? He's already published it. So I didn't have that, that word review. Luckily, you find some things out. So the bad, published and perish. People do things, they publish, but they do it badly. Some examples. So don't duplicate. Uh, here's a series of papers this author published with the exact same title, but with different uh, analytes, okay? Published in different journals. Atlantic Chemica Acta, Talanta, Talanta, and here's one in uh, any journal of chemistry. And, <clears throat> all right, so he's grinding out papers using the same technique. All right. People do this, maybe not very novel, original, but he, he does it. And it turns out this paper that we published in Tlaxo on formaldehyde had a figure in it that said amyline. <laughs> and my friend Sandy Dasgupta, he's an active, who's an expert on formaldehyde, formaldehyde, read the paper and he saw that. And did a search and found this paper on, on uh, amyline. And here are the figures in the two papers. They're the same, all right, he's using the same technique, right? That's understandable, but and here's the Formalda paper in Tlatus, and here's where the word amylin is in the caption of the figure. And here's the amylin paper. So they're the same figures, but it's, it's amylin. So this is something the reviewers missed, okay? Um, <coughs> the okay. If you compare the, pa the figures in the two papers, identical. So we made up two papers in one. Here's. Uh, an author published a paper in Tlanta on, on uh, measuring diphtheria with a mineral sensor. Okay? Well, about the same time he submitted a paper to Centrus National B, turning around and measuring the antibody uh, uh, instead of the diphtheria, he measured an anti diphtheria. Okay? All right, so he's grinding it out. All right? But let's compare those two papers. 
This is the Talanta paper figures. Here's the Esme D paper figures. Identical. Talanta paper figures. Esme D paper figures. Talanta figure. Why people do this? They're going to get caught. <laughs> you got both these published. Of course, you submit them about the same time, and the reviewers don't know about the other paper. <laughs> and of course, you can cross reference. This is a paper that was submitted to me, uh, and uh, the reviewers, it was a, it's a it Canadian Convention Silver. And the reviewer said, This is already been published, and he gave the journal. <coughs> and if you do uh, a search of the journal, you find it. And what the author claimed was that he submitted to the other journal, it got reviewed, they asked for revision, he revised it, sent it in, and he said, I didn't hear anything. So I just assumed it wasn't published. So he submits it to Talanta, and unless he be caught. And, and usually when something like this happens, the professor will say, my student said it, and I didn't know about it. But he admitted that he did send it to the other paper. He just did not do due diligence. And so I talk to talk to the relations. So at least we can just publish it again. Don't self-plagiarize. Uh, the reviewer has says that the authors here often change journals to increase the number of their papers. Uh, different paragraphs are not original, and this is something that that we have to look out for. Very often people won't cite those other papers. And they'll have big sections that are identical uh, from the prior paper. Don't send the same work to two different journals. Can you imagine somebody doing this? Uh, here's an uh, uh, email I got from Paul Haddock, who was re uh, an editor for Alpha Chemical Act at Tasmania. He handled chromatography. And he sent a paper to a reviewer, and the reviewer says, I've reviewed this same paper for Talanta. <laughs> so editors talk to one another. So, so we didn't publish that one. Uh, oh, I guess we. Do, or I, I guess Talanta published it, and, and, and ACA didn't. <coughs> Here's another one, um, uh, and this is a comment by Paul Haddock to, to, to the author. I've received uh, one review of this paper, and he. And while I was waiting for a second review, I noticed another paper by the authors published in Talanta. So we had already been published in Talanta and then submitted to ACA. Uh, this is a little bit of his interesting history. Back in 1995, I received a paper submitted, I, I received a paper to review for Fresenius. And at the same time, I got essentially the same paper submitted to Talanta. So I was the reviewer and the editor. And, and so the author, he was unfortunate that, that I was selected as the reviewer. And the only difference was that he added acetyl acetone in, in, in the uh, Fresenius paper. And all the figures and results were identical otherwise. And uh, so I wrote to Fresenius. I said, I've got this paper uh, in Talanta, and it's identical and so forth. So Fresenius, of course, writes to him and says, we're not going to publish this. We shouldn't, shouldn't have done this. So sometimes coincidences coincidences happen and that authors uh, don't luck out. Uh, again, editors do talk to one another. This is, this is a paper that was submitted to uh, Journal of Agriculture, Food, Chemistry. And they sent it to a reviewer, and the reviewer says, I've already reviewed this for Talanta. <laughs> and and uh, we still had a process. I hadn't accepted it. I said, yes, we have this paper under review, and the reviewer has discovered that parts of it are plagiarized from another author. I sent that to the editor. So, so very often we luck out, sometimes we luck out, we do the same reviewers. Don't plagiarize. Uh, this is a paper I got. I sent out for review. It says, the reviewer says, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Parts of it have been taken by the papers, and even more, as it appears, that the entire text are simply lifted from the published work. And he gives examples. This says, although too large was changed to F unit was too large. Down here it says, remote unit was changed to movie unit, so forth. 
and the he cites his paper by Garris. Who was the reviewer? It was Garris. So I like that on that one. All right, here's a good example of plagiarism. Uh, this is a paper that uh, John McCallum <coughs> my co-editor, uh, received. He, he used to handle uh, the Middle East, who got Jose Luis Bur on board. And he got this paper from Egypt. And he sent it for review, and the reviewer said, OK, and I published. And it's, it's a, uh, an electrode, I selected electrode for determining chromium-3 and oxalic medium. Well, it got published, and a couple of weeks after it was published, Orlando Patavillo from Brazil, a good guy I know, likes to me, he says, Gary, I'd like you to compare this with this paper I published six years before in Alvin Letters on iron. Same exact title, but for iron and an oxalic medium. All right, so you compare the two papers. Here's the introduction in the Tulanta paper and the analytical letters. They're identical, except these changed the word iron. Okay, that's the only difference. The uh, text is identical, word for word. The figure, now here's where the reviewers love now again, because he used the same figures, but he forgot to change he put the change iron to chromium in the caption, but he forgot to change iron to chromium in the figure. Okay? And here's another example. Here, here's the uh, caption is changed to chromium, but the figure itself is still iron. Although in one figure he did change the iron to chromium. So you can get a little sloppy there. Uh, and of course the, the data were all identical. So at first when John Michel contact me, you die, you die, you die, but that's what they do. So we retract these papers, but the problems are still in the literature, and uh, although the uh, refracted papers are not removed, and the, type, the literature, um, uh, it does say that it, uh, we have a retraction note and so forth, but it's out there somewhere, and they still get cited sometimes. And of course, editors will blackball uh, some <coughs> Authors, this is this is a, a letter from Jerry Gabo when he was so like the editor of Alcohol Letters writes to an author that he plagiarized the paper and we're gonna black it or let us give send this to other editors. We do sometimes write to each other and, and warn of certain authors. Now I'm gonna talk about the biggest fraud case in chemistry. I made a lot of press. A man by the name of Payan Sharon I, I got many papers from this guy. Sometimes they were from Padium, sometimes they were from Sharon G. It took me a while to put two and two together, the same guy. And, and he always had different email addresses. And they were all the same type of papers. He had a new reagent determined selenium. He synthesized new reagents <coughs> and then applied them to different, different analytes. Um, and so he finally got caught. He submitted a paper to Analytical Chemical Acta uh, for <coughs> determining arsenic. And Sani Dasgupta got it. He's a world expert on arsenic. He sent it to a couple of his students who, who were experts on arsenic. And they both discovered it was plagiarized from a Japanese paper for determining chromium. And he was using diphenyl carboside as the reagent, which is a chromium 6 reagent. It won't even react with arsenic. And, and so uh, this upset Sandy very much, of course. Sandy himself is from India. And so he writes, uh, of course, a very nasty note to, to, the, to, to Sharon Jeevy and copies his, his uh, department chair, uh, who kind of knew something was going on and was sweeping her room up until he got caught. So this opened up an investigation. <coughs> and so, um, so all he did was change the word chromium to arsenic in that paper. I, I got copied on that from Sandy Dasgupta, and I thought, thank goodness I don't have to look at this guy's papers anymore. I kept getting many, many papers from him. And at the very same day I got this email from Sandy, I got an email from another uh, Indian author, an organic chemist, who said, this organic synthesis is nonsense. And uh, it turns out he's making up all these synthesis. I'll give you a little more details here. Uh, so this, this is a paper that I had rejected, uh, that, that the fellow said that organic chemistry was wrong. Um, and so he turns around and submits it uh, a couple weeks later 
to another journal, the Journal of Hazardous Materials, and then it had uh, three more authors by the time I got there. And, and uh, the abstract and text were identical to the one he submitted to Solanta. Actually, we, we had published that to Solanta, I guess. And the tables, the figures were identical, only slight changes in numbers and tables. So, for example, here's the table from the uh, J. Hazardous Material. Uh, the data paper, here's one from Atlanta paper. We have 25.7, 30.7, 50.5, 50 60.5. See, obviously he's making up these numbers. And uh, this is just one of many other examples where this guy made up papers. Um, I in, in 2006, I received nine papers from him, one over a month and a half or so, and they're all similar type things. And I get them reviewed, and the reviewers, reviewers say this is not a great novel. Uh, and I start rejecting them without review. But finally, he kept sending these papers. I thought, this guy's really trying hard. I really feel kind of badly about rejecting <coughs> all of them. And a couple of papers, the reviewers, reviewers said, there's nothing really exciting about this, but nothing wrong with it. You can probably publish it. So I published a couple of papers. Big mistake. Because then I got a paper every three weeks from him. And this is what he did. Once an editor accepted a paper, he would just flood that term with papers. And uh, um, so, uh, for example, he had six, uh, six papers submitted and one accepted in 2005 at Chemisphere. He had five rejected for that review in 2006. He had 10 papers published in Environmental Monitoring and Assessment. This is a very short period of time. At the time he got caught, he had uh, in the Journal of Hazard Materials, he had five published, he had eight in press at the same time. He was just flooding the editors with these papers. Uh, and it, it, it was quite amazing. And, and, uh, and here's a rejected pay, I, a paper I had rejected for him, cloud, cloud point extraction of, of palladium. He submitted it three weeks later to Journal of Hazard Material. And this is one that had three additional authors, and it got accepted. So the bottom line is in three years, Chair and Chibi published 70 papers in 25 different journals. Some of me are heard of the journal, but he, got, he just looked everywhere he, where he could publish. He had two, I, I, look, I did a spreadsheet on 50, 15 of his papers I had tracked down, and he had 27 different co-authors in those 15 papers. His university does not allow a professor to have more than six students. He had 56 co-authors in all these papers. The equipment he was supposed, to, was supposed to be using did not exist in his university. <laughs> uh, so I gave, I gave this talk at the University of Maryland uh, on the way to Europe, to European Union. University of Maryland is my alma mater. And there was a, and that's near Washington, D.C., where chemical, chemical engineering news is, the American Chemical Society. And there was a, a lady in the audience whose husband is a reporter for Chemical Engineering News. So I get back home and I get an email from him, from her husband, wanting more information about this. So I sent him about 120 emails documenting what this guy had done. I took a lot of time to that for a while. So he writes this big long article in Chemical Engineering News about what this guy had done, massive case of fraud. <coughs> and he quotes some of the things he published uh, through a wide variety of email addresses. Sharon G. Bean claimed to be using advanced implementation not available at the university. The chemistry in most of his papers is illogical. Here's what he's doing. He's charging students money to get papers out and get the degrees. The, the, the department chair, and then somebody's come in, emails to me and says, yeah, I'm wondering how the, all these students were getting out in two years. <laughs> and of course, the students learn this from him. Some of them are doing the same thing. I, and I said, I hated seeing papers coming from this guy, uh, obviously. And, and so Sharon Jeeves' tactic was to flood journals with manuscript submissions in the hopes of wearing down out of who would eventually publish some of his work. And, and it, it was bad. Um, and so what, what he was doing, well then, then as soon as the senior news article got online, I get a call 
an email from the, uh, a reporter from Science Magazine, and they only talk about the good stuff. And so they, I sent him all the same 120 emails. And so he starts the article out. This time it's chemistry first. After all the series of high-profile scientific misconduct on stem cell biology and physics, uh, an Indian professor has been punished for doing all this. And then uh, I got uh, also published uh, oh, an interview with science. Jerry and Jimmy said that the charges against him are baseless and not correct. He blames colleagues and journal editors for creating this nuisance. Says that he plans to take action in the International Court of Justice. Yeah. <laughs> um, the problem is false culprits and false papers won't be known because they're still out there floating around. And um, then RC Chemistry in Great Britain got onto it and, and wrote an article on it. And they had a reporter in India write in the spot and they got some more information. And they're the ones that found out, out about this. Other, some of these authors, I mean, they, they finally did an investigation on him. They wrote about a 250 page report, but they didn't make it public. But they did a one page summary. His, his punishment was. He could not take students, he could not have grants, and he could not have an administrative position. I think he had no grants anyway, he had no students anyway, and, and uh, he had happened, he was the vice chair of the department at the time, so they, he had stepped in there. He was like seven years from retirement and they let him coast, I think. They didn't fire him, he should be in jail, I think. And I think that, uh, so, so he, he would start the day by asking his students, well, what have you downloaded today? They would go look for old papers. Downloading copy, and so uh, he got started. He visited another chemistry professor's lab, and he got a, a, a preprint of a paper of his, and that's where he got the template. And and this professor found out about it. And what he's doing, he, he was claiming to synthesize these new reagents. So he had a new reagent for selenium. And I, I had sent it to him for chemistry to, to review, and yeah, I assumed the organic chemistry was okay, which turned out it was false. And so then he determined selenium in water to do this. Then he determined, get another paper, he determined selenium in blood. And then he changed a functional group on it and go through the same iteration and, and so forth. And then he changed selenium to copper and go through all these iterations. And he's just grinding out all these papers, all identical. Of course, not cross-referencing anything, and you send them all at the same time, and the reviewers couldn't know about them. Uh, it was quite amazing. <clears throat> so meanwhile, Sharon and Jamie, this is what he told RSC Magazine, uh, says the case against him was fabricated, and the inquiry uh, committee was one-sided. By April, I will be ready to fight in the court. He told Chemistry World there's nothing to worry about. He actually threatened to sue Sandy that's good for millions of dollars. And, and, and uh, after this investigation was complete, the, uh, they got a new vice rector who reopened it because he wanted to know why all these department chairs uh, from geography, geology, physics, mathematics, uh, uh, about four, environmental chemistry, about four or five department chairs were co-authors with him. So I don't know what the result of that was. But he didn't, he didn't hold a grudge. He, I, I got this email one day saying, uh, from Peyton Sheer and Jimmy, I'd like to add you to, as a predator on my high five. <laughs> so that's the biggest case of fraud. Don't try to fool the editors. Uh, this was in the days of paper manuscripts. And uh, I got a paper from China, and uh, I think it should have gone to John Michelle. But anyway, in those days, when you got something that came across the ocean, you just took care of it instead of sending it back and so forth. So this is a paper that was handwritten, very long, very detailed. It took this guy a long time to write this paper. And he sends it to me. And the references weren't too you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I happened to get that paper just before I had a trip to Belgium. I stopped to visit John Michel Kaufman, my co-editor. He had the same exact handwritten paper on his desk. He sent it to both of us and spent a lot of time. So uh, again, coincidence, I had the trip at the right time, otherwise we would, neither one of us would know about this. 
Well, this is an author I got a lot of papers from. Again, the same thing over and over. A novel, letter chemical method of some sort. And I was sending that out to review, and the reviewer says this is not novel, and so forth. So this is the paper I had rejected. A couple, three weeks later, he turns around and resubmits it. to says, I'm Michelle Coffin. It's a paper from India. I handle papers from India. Luckily, John Michelle, you know I had a paper from India, reassigned it to me. And I'd already rejected it. So I write, this manuscript was recently rejected. This is to the author. Uh, after review, and I did the manuscript and I reviewed Then sent it to Editor Kaufman, I guess hoping that you would have a review again. And so forth. As the reviewer pointed out before, the electro, uh, et cetera, uh, <coughs> of novelty. We will not proceed with this manuscript. And uh, so this is the review I had on it. And the reviewer said, I've seen so many papers from this guy, very similar, and he somehow gets them published. If you turn it down, he'll submit it somewhere else. And editors should know about this. And so actually, I sent this to you know, editors of Malcolm Timothy and the Academy Act, uh, uh, analysts, and so forth. And a lot of them said, yeah, we have a problem with this guy, too. We do get the same thing. So uh, again, editors do talk to uh, and I've never done this before, and the only time I've done it, I wrote to this, this author, I said, I, I had many papers from you, and I, had, and I feel an obligation when I don't have a paper reviewed, and most of them have not been reviewed, uh, I would have to justify why. Scientifically, why am I not going to have this reviewed? I felt that was my duty, and it took a lot of my time, lots of time yet, and I go back and find prior correspondence with him that's on a similar paper, can you read this, and so forth. I had to take a lot of my time. So finally I wrote an email to him and said, uh, I've tried to be fair with you on these papers, but I've concluded that Calandra's not the proper place for the papers. And so I haven't any more department since. I, actually, he did send a review paper to me afterwards, and I said, didn't you get my email? He said, what's the review? <laughs> I had it with this guy. We do ask uh, authors to suggest reviewers, and sometimes they'll suggest somebody from their own department. Um, if it's from their own country, I tend to take a grain of salt. I may or may not use a, a suggested reviewer, but I usually try to find a separate one anyway. But this is a paper I had from India, and it had multiple authors on it. And, I, and one of the suggested groups was a, 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 a fellow from Japan. Okay, so that's outside of India, I'll send it there. He writes back, thank you, but I see I'm an author on this paper. <laughs> well, um, uh, some authors will submit a rejected paper sometime later and hope the editor doesn't remember. And, and, and this is a fellow from Egypt that sent the same paper over and over and over to different editors. And he finally got one accepted after three revisions. It was the same paper. Some went to John Michel, then, then we got Jose Luis Pereira on board, and went to him, and he would reject it, and so forth. That's something very, very good. Um, of course, if you, uh, and if you resubmit it to another journal, which you can, of course, do pay attention to the reviewers from the first paper, because it will improve the paper. And very often, as you've seen, the reviewers will be the same. And they'll say, I've seen this before, nothing changed. So do pay attention to reviews that are reviews. The peer review system is to, for your advantage as well as for the editor. And maybe you send it to the wrong journal. And another journal will be appropriate. But take advantage of the critique that you've got from experts already. Uh, this is a re uh, review of Dear Gary. Uh, I have seen this paper before. Not much has changed. I cannot follow logic, etc. So uh, another journal had used the same review. Dear Dr. Murray, I submit the following paper to uh, Kalanta. Dr. Murray was the editor of Anthropic Chemistry, Bryce Murray. So I know he, he's recycling it. So it raises a red flag. Dear Professor Christian, I submit this paper to Anthropic Chemistry. <laughs> red flag. <laughs> They're too lazy to even change their cover letter. And these are real examples. Um, Here's another, this is an email I think from Paul Added again, yes. I uh, uh, received a review of manuscript for ACA, 
the reviewer comments about seeing such an event in the Center for Atlanta. So again, submit, I said, Dear Paul, yes, we have seen that paper and rejected it. So the author is recycling it, attaches the review that we received. <coughs> yes, editors talk to one another, especially when we get the same reviewers again. So students, uh, don't plagiarize the introductory material. Uh, material. Sometimes when you're writing your thesis, you have an uh, introduction, you cite the literature and so forth, and you may copy that word for word when you start writing the paper. And you may be plagiarizing, self self plagiarizing, something like that. And remember, you may not catch this. As I say, submit to the right journal, uh, read your age and scope. As I say, we often get papers that have absolutely nothing to do with chemistry maybe physical chemistry paper or something, or maybe something using straw for remediation of pollutants in water. What's that got to do with physical chemistry? Why they submit them to me? I don't know. It's easy to get rid of those. Um, of course, uh, we, we're an international journal. We get papers from all over the world, and so English is a second language for a lot of people, and so their English may not be very good. So. Uh, this reviewer says the main problem with the paper is English. Well, so we understand, we understand that, but try to get expert uh, help. Don't afraid to get somebody else to, to check on your English. In fact, there are professional English editors nowadays. And even if the English is excellent, it doesn't hurt to have somebody else look at the paper and critique it. And it will help the reviewers understand and accept the work if you can get your English uh, in good shape. <coughs> You can, of course, rebut reviewer comments. Sometimes they would miss something or just don't understand. Um, <coughs> two reviewers may have different opinions, but I fear to me, my, to me as the editor to make the decision to decide which one is correct. Uh, very often, if I have a, a negative review in detail, I'll probably rely on that. Whoops. There are a number of plagiarism detection tools that we use. And all our papers now uh, automatically uh, give us authenticate, or they call it cross-reference, cross I think. And, and this is a beautiful technique. It, it color codes all the text in the paper against other publications. And so you can tell, normally you might have 15 or 20 percent duplication in a paper from, because they're using the same uh, experimental and so forth some of it's the author's name and all that. So that's, that's okay. But when it gets up to 30, 40, 50 percent, then that raises a red flag. And, and I start looking at that those duplications very carefully. And, and also, I, it's a good source of getting reviewers. You can find something that, that, that comes up and they haven't even referenced it. Um, and you a reviewer. And there are a number of other things you can use in a Viewers can use to look for similar papers like Medline, Scopus, Google Scholar, SciFinder Scholar, and so forth. So it's harder for authors these days to get away with duplication and plagiarism, although some of them still try. And I got one the other day when 60% of the paper was copied from another one of the authors. He didn't reference the paper. I uh, just give some statistics. This is before I got. Uh, uh, Ian McKelvey on board to help me when I was getting close to 500 papers, 478 that year. And about a third I rejected without review. So I was a reviewer, it takes a lot of my time, but it saves reviewer time. And another third was rejected after review. So about a third were accepted overall. And that varies a little bit from year to year. A typical specific. So students be brave, uh, write that first paper and you'll only learn by doing. And one of, one of the most valuable things that I learned as a, as a graduate student, my professor let me lose, I had to write my own papers. And, and I learned how to do it. And my stu I've had some students tell me that the most valuable thing they learned from me was not their science, was how to write. Because no matter what job you have, you have to communicate. And writing and oral communication is very important in what you do. So that's almost important, or more important than the science you do. Um, so expect criticism from both your professor and from reviewers. It's absolutely normal. So don't be insulted if you have uh, crit 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 critical reviews. Uh, and I say almost all the papers, those papers I do accept, virtually all of them need some revision. 
Uh, I probably can count on on one hand how many papers I've accepted without any change of reviews. And usually those are papers that I get a review. I cannot get a good review. I get a paper, a reviewer says it's fine, published, and I, I try to get out of it, I give up. So I just accept it. So it's very rare though. It's very rare. And as I said, uh, over half our manuscripts are accepted. So thank you and happy writing. <laughs>
to you to comment on, on, on these aspects? Uh, the physicists, nuclear physicists in particular, tend to do this because they work in huge groups of the international, uh, whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, that's really a hard one. Uh, but I do get a number of papers where there'll be eight authors, even ten, you know, and I, I, why, why? And you know that they're patting each other on the back. Um, and I, I have had papers uh, that have been accepted and published. And I'll get a letter from one of the authors saying, I was not aware of this. I don't want my name on this paper. They, you know, they've been in my lab or something. And so please take, please reject the paper. You know, I have to deal with these. That, that happens. Um, when, when the Chinese first started publishing, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, not just in science, every, every area of publication, they were flooding the journals. And some of the examples I gave where they were submitting the same paper to two different journals were from China at that time, because they were getting basically a year's salary if they could get published in a Western journal. And uh, also, Roy, Royce Murray told me that if they get cited in a Western journal, they would get rewarded. So I used to get papers from China, and <coughs> all, the chi all the references would be Chinese papers. Then they started getting cited in reference, in, 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 uh, or published in Western journals. So all the references then would be from Western journals, but be all Chinese authors. So they have each other on the back. So they play games like this. And, and your example of where uh, enemies were involved and so forth, that gets more political. Uh, and I don't know how you deal with that, but that is more political than probably than scientific. And, and they should still, of course, cite the work. And anybody that's that's knowledgeable in the field is going to know about it, right? So uh, it's hard to ignore. But yeah. But in any case, sorry, in any case, the, the fraud in the, the relatively the percentage of the fraud in science uh, compared with the fraud in politics or yeah. is, is uh, it's low. Small. Is it? It's small, yeah. yeah. Self pleasure is a little more common. Don't move yet. I get. I need a picture of this audience. <laughs> <laughs> but you have seen, so maybe we better ask for somebody to come and take the picture as well. Smile. <coughs> wow. uh, I've got to reboot it here. <laughs> In that case, may I ask you to sit here and I will take a picture of you and the audience? Can I? So they became friends, 
uh, they became friends afterwards. But we still had some of the people working here in the faculty, some of the secretaries, and some young colleagues. And they were saying, when they were looking at people, and they said, oh, this is so and so. So they knew the names. They had written, the, they had read the names. So they were happy that they could come and finally have that person come into their a school, because usually you think that they are in some cloud, <laughs> right? Okay, thank you very much again, and I hope you come again, as I mentioned, and we will have uh, uh, another meeting.